asleep, right? But now it's the machine. I, boy, I'm, I'm in bad shape. All right. Um, this morning I want to talk about the joy of slavery. How many of you have ever thought about there being joy in slavery? Kind of two words that don't seem to go together, does it? But uh, we're going to see what the Lord says this morning about that. I actually find a lot of joy in slavery. And uh, we're going to take a look at that and see what the Bible really says about it and how it can give us joy. So uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into God's word. Father in heaven, Lord, this morning we do want to pause and thank you once again for the, the gift of life in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that every person that's represented here this morning represents a... A, a child that has been bought at an infinite price, that nothing was too much to pay that we might be redeemed and saved. And Father, that value is placed in what was paid, the price that was paid. Uh, certainly here on earth, we talk about money, we talk about euros, we talk about dollars, we talk about yens, we talk about all sorts of currencies. But there is no amount of currency in this world, on this planet, that could equal the price that was paid in Jesus Christ. We are incredibly valuable to you, so much so that you gave your life for us. So this morning, Father, as we delve into that concept and the joy that we might have in understanding that more fully, we pray that you pour out your spirit upon us. <coughs> Touch our hearts, <clears throat> touch our minds, and touch these lips that I might speak the words of life to my friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I was uh, coming home, I think it was from low prayer meeting the other night, and uh, I was listening to NPR and they were interviewing a gentleman that uh, I think is Kevin Bay, something like that. He wrote a book recently called uh, Blood and Earth, I believe is what it is. And it talks about human slavery in the 21st century. He's not doing a historical thing on you know, what slavery was like back in the South in the, in the United States of America, or what it was like in Europe or in in um, Europe or, or South America or, or North America, or excuse me, or, or, or um, where am I trying to say, Africa. <coughs> but he's talking about slavery in uh, the 21st century. And by the way, I don't know if you know that there were a lot of Europeans during the 1500s and the 1600s that were sold into slavery into North Africa. So slavery is no respecter of people. But this is one of the things that came out of that particular um, story on NPR, on the radio. A 2014 report by the United Nations estimates that tens of millions of people in the world are currently enslaved. Most of them are in the developing world. Where? In the developing world, okay. Where they work in mines, quarries, or shrimp farms for no money and without hope of escape. Now, tens of millions, that's in the 21st century, friends, that people are enslaved today. You would think that that was horrendous, that that, was, that couldn't possibly be true. Slavery, uh, it says of here, slavery is the complete control of one person by another, and violence is used to maintain that control in all forms of slavery. Author Kevin Bales explains to Fresh Airs Dave, uh, Davies. The adults in that situation know that if they attempt to leave, they may be killed. So it's an incredible uh, problem in our world today. And I remember reading uh, when I first became an Adventist, and probably up to, I don't know, first 10 years or so, I remember reading in Spirit of Prophecy of how she talks about how uh, the slave owners will be judged more harshly. I don't know if you've ever read those because of their cruelty to the slaves under them. And I always thought of that in terms of 
uh, America, you know, the Civil War era and things like that. And I'm sure that that was part of it. But friends, slavery has not ended. It's not just back there in Egypt. It's not just back there in, in old colonial America or any place like that. It's unfortunately alive and well today. Alive and well today. These are some uh, gentlemen down in, uh, I think it's Argentina, I'm not sure, but it's down in South America. And they uh, look like they're just miners going to work, right? Well, they're actually slaves, they're enslaved. In the past 20 years, almost 50,000 enslaved Brazilian workers have been freed from some 2,000 work sites, from cattle ranches to charcoal plants for pig iron production. Uh, since 2004, a national uh, lista suja, or dirty list, has fingered some 300 guilty companies, making it hard for them to get financing. In other words, these companies hire these people ostensibly to give them a better life, and then basically they enslave them. They and they supposedly pay them a wage, but they give them just enough to keep, the, keep them in debt to them. And so they are basically uh, in, enslaved for the rest of their lives. Here's uh, some young people over in India. Uh, looks like he's out uh, collecting rocks. He's a rock hound, right? Unfortunately not, he's a slave. Uh, this is on the generations of slaves who work in the quarries of northern India. They're in a hereditary slavery, and that means the people that have quarried have never known freedom. They were born into slavery, and when you've never known freedom, when you've never been outside the quarry, you've never been to another village, you've never seen a school, you've never heard a doctor's appointment, you've never seen a newspaper, all the list of all the things we expect in freedom don't apply to these people. And they simply say, if you talk to them, my family has always belonged to that family, and this is where we are, and this is what we do. This is their life, to live as slaves. Um, there's another situation there. India is home to some 14 million modern-day slaves, nearly half the total worldwide, uh, half of the total worldwide, according to this newly compiled index. So some of these figures are obviously a little bit um, off. The first one said millions, but here we have 14 million just in, in um, India alone, right? So, and unfortunately, the reality is, is that there are slaves in America today still. Did you know that? It's a dirty little secret that we don't really understand, or we don't really, it doesn't register, I guess, that there are a lot of slaves in America today. They're either uh, house cleaners or home care cleaners. Um, they're either sex slaves. They're in some kind of slavery of some sort where they can't go home. Every once in a while, you'll see a story in the news, you know, about this sort of a thing. It comes out. For every one, there are uh, evidently thousands uh, that are in that situation, unfortunately. So slavery is not something that we typically think of with joy attached to it, right? This is the kind of slavery that we're used to thinking about, reading about, or whatever it is. But we're going to take a look this morning at slavery as the Bible looks at it. And we're going to see if we can understand if there can be possibly any joy in slavery. Now, maybe we ought to give a definition of slavery before we go any further. Webster's, <coughs> Webster's says, submission to a dominating influence, a drudgery or toil. Sometimes you kids, you probably feel like your mom is, is treating you like slaves, you know. You gotta just do all this and we're just slave labor or whatever. It's drudgery, it's toil. Uh, the state of a person who is the property of another. Okay, that's, that's another definition of, of slave. So let's go to Romans chapter 6. You turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6 and we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about slavery. Romans 6, verse 16. Romans 6, oops, 
Romans 6, verse 16. And Paul says here, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? So as we look at this, how many slaves do you see in this verse? Just pick it apart. How many slaves are there here? There are two, right? There's a slave to sin, and there's a slave to righteousness, right? Okay, so what we're going to see here is that throughout the Bible, you'll get a concept that there are actually only two kinds of slaves in the world. Now, if the Bible is our focus, if it's our worldview, then we can understand that, that there are only two kinds of slaves in the world. There's a slave to sin, and there's a slave to righteousness. Now, <clears throat> when we look at this on uh, the screen, we see that we become slaves of sin or lawlessness, and then on the other side we see that we become slaves of Christ or righteousness. All right? It's only two. You don't have a middle ground. Now, friends, it's a fundamental truth that we're looking at this morning that we are all slaves. Amen? Some of you are not real sure about that. Let me, let me try that again. It's a fundamental truth of the Bible that we are all slaves. Okay. That we are born slaves. It used to be quite a remarkable thing that, in fact, I think it's, I know it's past, but there was a time where there were still some of the southern African Americans that were, who had been born slave that were still alive. And it was quite a remarkable thing to find somebody that had been born into slavery, you know, and be able to interview them and talk to them about what it was like, right? Because it was, it was an incredible time. It's a long gone era in our in our, in our society today. Unfortunately, there are some people that still seem to be back in that day and age. But when, when it comes to, to being able to meet a real live slave, guess what? All we have to do is look in the mirror. Right? We are the people our parents warned us about. And so we're born slave, but, but, you, but you might say, Pastor, you, you, you're thinking, I thought Christ came to set us free, right? Yeah, Romans, or not Romans, but um, uh, John 8, 32, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And then verse uh, 38, I think it is, uh, and if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And you might say, yeah, there it is, right? We're free. We're no longer slaves, Right? Praise the Lord, we're no longer slaves. Well, let's see if the Bible has a little bit of the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. So let's look at verse 17 and 18. So it says here in 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of what? Slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became what? Slaves of righteousness. So we go from one slavery to the next, right? In a sense, that's the only choice we have, beloved. We are either slaves to sin or we are slaves to righteousness. And what Christ sets us free from is the slavery to sin because when you're a slave to sin, do you have a choice? Do you have any freedom whatsoever? Do you have the ability to do what's right? No, there is absolutely no ability to do what's right, to do what's righteous, okay, when you're a slave to sin. But once you're set free from that slavery to sin and you become a slave of, of righteousness, then the tables are turned. And God says that, that we obey from the where? From the heart. And we are transformed. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at it on the screen again here. So 
uh, we become obedient from the heart and we're set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. There's no in-between part there. And one of the things that I fell into, and one of the things many of us fall into in the world, is that there is a third place, there's a third uh, station in life, so to speak. That I don't want to worship Satan, and I don't want to worship God. I'll just go along my merry way, and I'll do my own thing. You ever heard that? You ever done that? Yeah, that's the way I lived for a long time. I wasn't interested in Satan worship. I wasn't inter interested in God worship. I just did my own thing. And so I was in that third spot, right? That middle spot. I wasn't too crazy this way and I wasn't too crazy that way. I was just crazy in the middle. At least that's what I thought. Now, of course, if you had seen me in those days, you would have said I, you were crazy on the left side, <laughs> you know, definitely. So, so but, but the problem is, is that the Bible doesn't teach that. And when you begin to realize that we are born with a carnal nature, with a fallen nature, that we're, the, the default setting for mankind is being a slave to sin. Now, how many of you like being a slave to sin? I am so glad nobody raised their hand. Although, if you had, you would have been pretty honest. Amen? Amen? Because sometimes we like sin. In fact, if sin wasn't likable, we wouldn't have the problem with it that we do, right? It's enjoyable. That's the problem with sin. And so even though we find ourselves being slaves to sin, we, we are doing it sometimes because we like it. All right. Now, in verse 18 and 19... Uh, it says, or, or 18 rather, it says, we need to make a decision. Are we going to become a slave of righteousness? Now, beloved, how do you get from one plantation to the other? Right? How do you get from one state of slavery to the other state of slavery? How do you do that? Change masters? All right. Yeah. There's something about changing masters, but is, is it that easy? Do you know how hard it was to escape from slavery in the South? In fact, if you were, if you were caught, if you tried to escape and you were caught, uh, many times you were whipped, many times, sometimes you were killed, sometimes you were left in shackles, uh, they put price tags on your head. There was a tremendous amount of energy put into capturing escaped slaves. Do you ever feel like that's that whole apparatus is still in existence when it comes from trying to escape from the slavery of sin? It seemed like the devil just pulls out all the straps to keep you his slave? Does it sometimes seem like, you know, you, you, you make these promises and you're trying to get away from that plantation where you're a slave of sin, and it seems like you just can't get away? And it, even when you start to get away, guess what? He's right there on your tail to drag you back. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, that's the nature of it. So, so, so Satan, that master who brings us into the slavery of sin, puts an enormous amount of energy into keeping us his slave. And we feel almost as though it's impossible to get away. Well, let's go over to chapter 6 here. Stay in verse 6. Uh, or chapter 6, rather, and go to verse 1 and 2. So Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Then he says, certainly not, or God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now what's the clue that Paul gives to getting out of from one plantation to the other, from the slavery of sin to the slavery of righteousness? What's the clue he gives us here? He says we have to die, Right? If you're going to be set free from that plantation of slavery to sin, you've got to die to get out of there. They've got to carry you out in a pine box, as it were. Right? That's the only way you're going to get free of it, beloved. You've got to die to get off that plantation of sin. Now, that's pretty, pretty heavy, isn't it? That's the only escape. I remember reading one time about the only escape from Alcatraz Prison. Anybody ever remember that story? Alcatraz Prison, it's off the, uh, 
the coast or in the bay there of San Francisco, and it was a pretty notorious maximum, uh, maximum security prison, and nobody had ever escaped from that prison. And I think there was three guys that supposedly attempted to escape, and they never found them. And what they theorized, and I think what the authorities hope, is they drowned or, you know, there's something happened because it's, it's on an island and they have to go across the water to get anywhere. But they never found any trace of them. And so they really don't know if they really escaped or not. But they were, in a sense, set free, right, either way? If they died in the process, they were no longer captives in Alcatraz. And friends, the only way that you and I can set, be set free from the slavery of sin is we got to die to get out of it. Now that sounds pretty hopeless, but there's good news about that. Because Paul goes on to say in verse 3, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Right? So, so in order to get free from the slavery of sin, we... The Lord has given us a ritual, as it were. And it's a typology. He's telling us that if you are baptized, then as you go down into the watery grave, that is where the old man of sin is to remain. You die to your sins, your slavery of sin. And then you come up from the watery grave and you come up to a new life in Christ. Amen? Amen? And then you have a choice to make. Because the Bible doesn't say that you just automatically start doing righteousness without a choice. You have to make a choice to become a slave of righteousness. Now, if you don't make that choice when you come up out of the watery grave, what happens? Guess what? The old man of sin comes back up, and you're still a slave of sin. So you haven't transferred from one plantation to the next. You've got to make a conscious choice of that. So we're baptized into his death. Now whose death are we baptized into? Christ. So we have to identify with Jesus. Amen? We have to make certain that we have decided to, to, to die with Christ to self and sin. Verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him. Notice it's with him. It's not just by ourselves. Friends, it is true that if you and I die tonight, we are no longer slaves of sin. Is that right? Sure it is. That's one thing that, that Jabril now has. He is at rest. He is no longer a slave of sin. He doesn't have to struggle with that stuff anymore. He's at peace. He's no longer a slave of sin. That's the reality of death. So we could do that ourselves, and we could fix the problem, right? Well, at least part of the problem. Because if you die to self or if you die yourself and not with Christ, then the resurrection you're wanting to come up in is probably not going to be the right one. Because what the Bible says is that we are buried with him, Christ, through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, friends, what we're looking at here is that God understood that you and I could not bring about that death on our own. We could not die to sin and, and still be able to live on after that by ourselves. And so knowing our selfish, our, our, our sin state, our, our slavery to sin, he came in the man Jesus Christ. And he came to live that life for us that we could not live. And while Jesus lived that life for us in, in our nature, the very nature that you and I have, was he ever a slave to sin? No. He never once gave in to that slavery of sin. So he was a slave of righteousness his entire life. Amen? And so he gives us that gift, that victory that he gained in that nature that is just like ours. He gives it to us, and in his death, we find a substitute. And so when we want to be, be able to move from that slavery to sin to the slavery of righteousness, we, all we have to do is say, I accept Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. And I ask him to come into my heart and into my life. 
It says in verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, notice what it says, we're united together in the likeness of his death. What's the likeness of Jesus' death? It's dying to self, right? It's giving up on self. It's recognizing that as long as you, dis- you continue to make decisions out of the si- sin slavery state, that you're going to continually make wrong decisions. You're con- going to continue to, to live a life of slavery to the sin that, that besets you. But he says, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So the good news is, friends, and when we, when we identify with Jesus, when we ask him into our hearts, when we accept what he has done for us, his life of, of righteousness, then as we combine our, or as we connect ourselves with him, just as he died to sin selfishness, he's going to raise us up to, sin, to righteousness, righteous slavery, in other words, righteously living. He's going to give us that which we could not get ourselves. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be what? Slaves of sin. Now this morning I know that even though you've been walking, many of you with the Lord for a long time, some of you for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, some of you for 10 years, some of you for one year, maybe one month, and you've all struggled with this slavery of sin. And you've asked the question that Paul asks and answers actually in chapter 7. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? Who is going to give me victory over this sin slavery? And Paul says, I thanks be to God, Jesus Christ, who saved me. I give my heart to the Lord. I surrender to him. I allow the old man of sin to be crucified with him. And you know, friends, when that happens, what takes place in your life? It says in verse 7, For he who has died has been freed from sin. We've been freed from sin. We don't have that issue anymore. We don't have that problem. In verse 19, it says, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. What does he say? He says to us as Christians, he says, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it is now your, char- your choice to make a decision. Just because you've been baptized, friends, does not mean that the old man of sin, the sin slavery, is left down there in the watery grave. When you come up from baptism, you have a choice to make. You have a choice of what plantation you want to be on, the slavery of sin or the slavery of righteousness. And some of us have not yet made that that decision to be slaves of righteousness. Because, friends, you cannot be anyone in this world except a slave. You are a slave of one sort or another. You and I are either slaves of sin or we're slaves of righteousness. And it's, there's no time to, to walk the fence, friends. It's no time to think that there's a third option here. This is the time to make the decision. And as you come up from that watery grave, friends, you've got to make the decision, Lord, I want my old man to stay dead. I don't want that guy, I want that lady, I don't want whatever it was about me, I don't want it to come up with me. I want to be free from that slavery of sin. And I want to become a slave of righteousness. Let me tell you a story, friends. You've heard it before, but I'm going to tell it again because I don't know what else to tell you. The Bible says that we're to witness of what has happened to us. And you've heard it before, but I don't know how else to share it. That that when I came up of that watery grave, that I came up and I had a decision to make, and my heart was happy. I was overjoyed that for the first time in my life, I was not a slave to sin. Let me tell you what that means. The Bible says, Paul says, that 
that you're not to present your members as, as slaves of unrighteousness, right? What does that mean? It means my hands were constantly doing sinful things, right? Can you relate to that? It means my ears were constantly listening to sinful things. It means my tongue was constantly saying things that were sinful. My feet were walking in sinful paths. I couldn't control my members. That's what it means to be a, a slave of sin. Even my mind, my thoughts, I couldn't control my thoughts. They were all slave of sin. That's what it's like, friends. You know what I'm talking about. And when I gave my heart to Jesus, he changed me. He took the, the old man of sin out of me and he buried him in that watery grave and he gave me a choice. He says, now you can go back to that if you want. God is a gentleman, isn't he? He lets you make a choice, friends. You can go back to your slavery to sin if you want. But friends, I'd been down that road. And I know that when you first start on that path of slavery to sin, uh, as a young kid, you know, you're thinking, wow, finally I'm free. I'm free from mom and dad. I'm free from my, my, uh, my teachers. I'm free from all those people that are trying to tell me what to do, right? And I go out fresh into that world and I start doing those things that I, I just longed to do but I couldn't do because my parents wouldn't let me. And I started doing them and, and boy, it was so much fun, kids. Sin is fun. Whoa. You ever think your preacher would tell you that? Is it a lie? Of course it's not a lie. That's the problem with it. Sin is fun. But the problem also that they don't tell you, that they didn't tell me at that time, is it bites like an adder. It's poisonous. And after a while, it started, that poison started seeping into my bones. And I realized that, you know, I didn't notice these chains before. Right? These things that I was doing that I was so free to do now, all of a sudden they start dragging on me. And they start bringing me, to that, bringing me down. And I realized that, you know, this freedom is not as free as I thought it was. And I understood the power of sin over our lives. And when Jesus came into my life, uh, when I looked back at that, I said, no way am I wanting to go back to that. I had somebody that for the first time in my life gave me the power to overcome my sinful self. I had for the first time in my life somebody that would give me the victory over that. And so I, I walked into that way and I said, Lord, make me a slave of righteousness. I want to do the right things. For the first time in my life, I want to think the right things. I want to say the right things. And you know, of course, I don't always do that. <laughs> but I try, right? That's my heart. Just to have the heart of a, of a slave of righteousness doesn't mean you're always doing everything perfectly right, but it means that your heart is inclined to that. And every once in a while, we all slip up. But then I presented my, my members, the, the members of my body, to righteousness. And I found that, you know, it, it, this was fun. For the first time in my life, I wanted to do what was right. That's a miracle, friends. It's an, it's an incredible thing. My hands, they didn't want to be quick to do those bad things. My hands wanted to be quick to do those good things. And I found it a joy. I, boy, this, is, this slavery is fun. This slavery to righteousness is fun. There's stuff here that I never dreamed that was so much fun to do. I mean, I thought that sin was fun for a while, right? Until it started biting me back. But then as I, I got that new heart from Jesus and I gave my heart to him and I, and I stayed crucified, I kept that old man down there. In other words, I didn't present myself in front of the sin anymore. Can you say Amen. That's our problem, friends. We spend too much time putting ourselves in front of the sin. I was just talking to a young man in the jail last week, and, uh, you know, he was talking about this and talking about that, that about getting out of, of jail, you know, and he was wanting to go the straight and narrow, get back to God and all that sort of a thing. And uh, he was saying things like this. He was saying, you know, he says, when I get out, I says, I'm not going to drink anymore. He says, but if I do, you know, I know that Jesus is right there. And uh, he talked like that about weed, you know, and dope and stuff like that. And I, I finally gently, I said, you know, I said, brother, I said, what you got to do is you got to think of yourself dead to those things. You, get, you can't give yourself a way out, right? That's what happens to too many of us. We give ourselves a way out, right? We hide that bottle in the, in the back uh, cupboard, you know, just in case. 
I mean, I want victory, but I'm just going to leave it there just in case. Is that a good idea? Are you kidding? If you're going to consider yourself dead to sin, then you throw the whole thing out. When you bury somebody, do you leave part of him unburied? Come on. You want to bury that whole sinful self, right? You want to keep it in the grave. And so you don't keep around those things. And I told him, you want to make sure that when you come out, you're not thinking like you're going to fall. You're thinking that by the power of Christ, I can do all things. And he'll give you the victory, friends. And I said, you know, and I gave him an illustration. I said, you know how uh, some, kind of, some ladies like to dress pretty provocatively? And Granny said, yeah. Ladies, this is common for us guys, so you guys close your ears. We're going to talk to guys right now, okay? So, so I said, when you see that lady that's dressing provocative, I said, what do you do? I said, when you see her, do you keep your eyes on her? And uh, he says, no. <laughs> and I said, what happens when you keep your eyes on her? He says, you can't keep your eyes off of her, right? In other words, the mind begins to do its thing, right? By beholding, you become changed. And so I said, what you do is you bounce your eyes. Now, we're all going to see, guys, we're all going to see provocatively dressed girls, right? But the trick is, don't linger, right? If your problem isn't girls, but it's a bottle of booze, right? Then don't sit there looking at that bottle, you know? If your problem is, is gossiping, getting on the phone and gossiping, don't put yourself there. When, you're, when you get to that point, you say, oh, no, we don't want to do that, right? And so you fill your mind with other things. You think on things of good report. And the power of God comes upon you, and, and you find yourself just giving yourself, your, the members of your body, to righteousness. You become a slave of righteousness, and you find it's, it's joyful to come over and shake somebody's hand, you know, and give them a, a high five or whatever it is. You, you want to give, you know, when you want to give till it hurts, right? Come on, somebody say amen. That's being a slave of righteousness. That's where it becomes a joy to be a slave, friends, that you love giving while it hurts because you know that Jesus gave until it hurt. And Jesus gave till it hurt so that you could be freed from the slavery of sin and become a slave of righteousness. Is there joy in slavery? You better believe it. Joy in the slavery of righteousness, friends. I would never in a thousand years want to go back to my former lifestyle. And I want to tell you, that I had a lot of fun, as the world calls it, all right? And now, kids, listen to me. I say it was fun, but I want to tell you something right now that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if I had stayed in that lifestyle, I'd be dead today. That's where that kind of fun leads. It'll kill you without eternal life. But I determined by the power of Christ to give my life to Jesus and he made me into a slave of righteousness. So now, he says, offer the parts of your body in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Friends, it's, in a lot of ways it's very similar. Just like you gave your hands up to grasp that bottle, that cigarette, uh, that bad thing, whatever it is, Start using that member of your body to grab things of righteousness. Turn away from that by the power of Christ. Let Christ into your heart and let him give you the victory. Let him give you the power to overcome. You don't know how you say, Pastor, I, I just, I've tried and tried and tried and I don't understand how. Then I want you to focus on the death of Jesus. I want you to look at that picture. Obviously, it's not exactly the way it was. I don't know how it was. Nobody knows. But that's Jesus. He just died for you. They just took him down from the cross. He bled. And you know, friends, the physical wasn't near what the mental and emotional and spiritual butchery that Satan heaped upon him. 
but he loved you so much and he wanted so much to free you from the slavery of sin that he went through that for you. When you're concerned, when you don't seem like you can get this thing called Christianity, get out of the one plantation of slavery to sin and into the other one of slavery to righteousness, focus on what he did for you, how much he loves you. Friends, if you were the only one, he would have come. If you were the only one, I can't tell you how much joy I have today because Christ helped me make that decision. Now, friends, I'm not lifting up myself. I'm just simply saying what Paul says. You know, we have to testify what we know, right? And for whatever, whatever it's worth, this is what I know. This is what happened in my life. Am I perfect? No, but I do understand what it's like to be a slave of sin and go to a slave of righteousness. And the way that I did it is to focus on what Jesus did for me. Incredible love. How many of you this morning would like to go from that plantation of sin of, or, or a slavery of sin and go over to the sin of righteousness? Let me see your hands this morning. Follow them to your feet then. Let's stand and ask the Lord to help us and understand and experience the joy of slavery. Father in heaven, this morning we want to understand the joy of slavery. Slavery to righteousness. We want to confess before you this morning, Lord, that we know that we were born slaves and we will die slaves. But Father, we may have been born in slavery to sin, but we want to die a slave of righteousness. We, want, we may have been born presenting our members to unrighteousness, but we want to die presenting our members to righteousness this morning. We want you to give us the victory, Lord. Please, Lord, if we haven't experienced it yet, we ask you to help us to beg you to not give up, to wrestle with you like Jacob on the banks of the Jabbok River until you give us the victory of Jesus Christ. Lord, please make us slaves of righteousness today and enable us to enjoy the slavery to God that we will with joy in our hearts go from place to place desiring to do what's right and glorifying you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your hymn, knows while you're standing. Turn to number 330.